Thanks for sticking around. So I want to welcome to the stage the film's writer, director, producer, James Ward Birkett. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So I just want to give you a quick bio here that Jim sent me, and then we're going to talk a little bit, and then open it up to questions, which you might have a few. You, I know, have a few. Uh, Jim graduated from CalArts with a degree in theatrical set design and worked on several uh, productions while pursuing a career as a storyboard artist in Hollywood. He was the conceptual artist on the first three Pirates of the Caribbean films and storyboarded dozens of other features as well as hundreds of commercials and music videos. He made coherence while completing work on the animated feature Rango, which he co-wrote and for which he designed several characters, including Rango, and also provided voices for <laughs> That's true. three characters. Uh, he was one of the art, uh, also one of the art directors and did storyboards for Edgar Wright's 2017 film, Baby Driver, which I'm hoping to screen at some point oh, as part of the great. series, because yeah. uh, I'm a big uh, fan of the film. So I guess, first of all, can you let all of these folks know uh, how, how the film came together conceptually and uh, talk a little bit about the writing process. Yeah, basically I was committed to making a, a low budget movie, you know, basically a, a zero budget movie. And these cameras had come out, these Canon 5Ds that suddenly gave the power to everybody to make a film. Before this technology existed, you had to wait around and you know, get a real movie camera to, to make a film. And so these consumer cameras came out and I was like, I've got to make a movie with this. And so uh, the guy that plays Amir in the film is, is a good friend of mine, Alex Manugian. And he and I were bouncing around ideas like how do we, how do we use what we have to make something cinematic and something great? And it just struck me like, all right, I got a, I got a living room. I have a, some friends who can act. That's it. That's, that's all we can really afford. What would make it feel bigger than that? And I just had this thought, like, what if you saw yourself out the window? And th this was years ago. This was before this slew of doubles movies came out and all these other things. So back when we wrote it, it was still a pretty fresh idea. There wasn't uh, you know, 50 things like that out there. And it just all kind of came together very quickly. Um, this idea of that I'd always wanted to do of, of sort of simplify the shoot, like get rid of the crew, get rid of the script, just have some cameras and some actors. And it, took, it did take a year to kind of figure out the story and all the twists and turns, but the way we shot it, we basically shot it over five nights at my house and did not tell the actors what was gonna happen. They got little note cards. Um, I would email them every day just notes about their own character, but they would have no idea what the other characters uh, were supposed to do. The lead girl, Emily uh, Baldoni, did not know she was the lead until the final night. So wow. it was just a lot of, a lot of improving and a lot of uh, flying by the seat of your pants. So, so no script, but a basic story outline that only you, yeah, only I you and, and Amir Alex, saw? And Alex, Alex knew it. And, yeah. and those beats were very structured, and, and I hear you talking about the similarities. You know, th there has to be a structure to a film. This would have never worked if we didn't have a very detailed plan of what the acts were, what the twists were, what the turns were, what the, the beats were. Um, it would have been a mess, and it should have been a mess anyway. This should have been a complete train wreck. Um, but because I had had years of learning the structure and, and the, the kind of mechanics of, of how a story needs to come together, that could be hidden underneath the mess of all the talking and all the overlapping and the seemingly uh, naturalistic approach to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's so interesting that your other job is a storyboard artist, which is literally pre-planning an entire film. Yeah. And so for your first feature, you make a film where there is no planning. Or only a sort of broad outline that two people know. Yeah, you know? that's weird. Like, I didn't storyboard it at all, and yet uh -huh. I could have never made it if I hadn't had years of storyboarding because just the instinctive ability to compose shots and to be thinking, all right, if I'm shooting this, what are the other three shots that I'm going to need to make this scene work? So I was operating a camera, and then I, the crew was just me and a, another cameraman and, and two sound people. 
So I would have to operate one camera, and, and I learned how to shoot and focus at the same time. So my other hand could be like directing people, you know, like telling the other guy to get this shot or telling this actor to move over here. So it was, it was really exhausting. I, and I had to do yoga for a week afterwards uh -huh. just, to, just to compensate because <laughs> my back was a mess. The whole time I was like um, crouched, you know, to, all, all the shots are very low. And um, so physically I was in these incredibly awkward positions for hours. Right. So, and the film was shot sequentially. Yeah. So, which, so, so my, one of my questions was how, if the, if the whole thing is shot over five nights and it's shot sequentially, how did you break down each day into chapters? Like, did each day, did, did it sort of have an arc that you were shooting for, or like points to get to, or was it more loose than that? Yeah, it was, it, it, it was very specific in what I needed to get every night. Yeah, again, um, the actors did not know. There was no AD to, to help you plan it, so it's just really keeping 5,000 things in my own mind um, as, as I went, and sometimes I'd mess up. You know, I remember this one night, maybe the third night, we're shooting and we're halfway through, and I'm like, oh my God, Hugh, aren't you supposed to have a Band-Aid on your forehead? We just shot like an hour without a Band-Aid. And so that's, on a real movie, you'd have a continuity person, you know, catching all those things, but this was just um, compensating for mistakes as, as you go. Right. Um, so obviously with all of the dialogue, or most of the dialogue is improv. Yeah. How, I know there are a few lines that you, that you yeah, guys it's, wrote. It's How, probably 95% improvised. I mean, again, they would know things, like, like they would know their backstories. They would know the story of the, the understudy and, the, and her and the dance show. She, I would give her that information, but it was up to her to say it any way she wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can't think of any other film certainly any other puzzle film where actually the construction, like the actual shooting, is also a puzzle. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, yeah. you didn't know, you just knew you were going to have all these pieces, and then your editor would come in and, and, uh, and help you put it together. Yeah, and he, uh, even during the shoot, I was adding scenes and realizing that I had to adapt to how the, the actors were taking it, because they'd take it in an energy that I wasn't expecting. Like the guy that plays Mike, the, the kind of volatile, um, alcoholic in there. He was playing it so rough and, and so much harsher than I had anticipated. And so we had to add that scene of him on the floor with his wife in a very sweet scene where they kind of forgive each other or she forgives him. Like I could just sense that it had to be balanced somehow. And there were examples like that throughout, like realizing, oh, they did one scene much funnier than I thought. So that means we have to compensate in a completely different way. or. They would often add things that I was not expecting, um, because if it's not written, they're just gonna they're just gonna go for it. They're just gonna take it down their own paths. And sometimes I had to let them get it out of their system too. They'd go down a path that was not I knew that was not usable, but I also didn't want to keep interrupting them. And, and so I'd let them go for several minutes and go, okay, now we're gonna come back, and this time, you know, maybe don't cry. <laughs> like, maybe they're going to take another energy there. So you have to really monitor people's um, process at the same time, because you don't, you don't want to say, I'm not giving you a script, yet you have to do exactly what's in my head. Like, that would be awful to have, an, yeah. to, have to do that as an actor. So you have to let them run with yeah. it and then compensate in, in a different way. Because then you're Lars von Trier. Well, yeah. Basically. <laughs> Uh, so, so a lot of the students in the room are first year students, their first film class. Oh, okay. So can you tell them about shooting ratios like this versus, let's say, a typical Hollywood feature? Like how many mean, hours of footage did you end up with? Yeah, I mean, film? we have a lot of hours because we were shooting the whole time. The whole theory was I wanted to make a movie where we were shooting all the time, where on a normal movie you're just waiting around most of the time. I don't know if you've been to sets, but Almost all of movie making is waiting. You're waiting for the actors to come out of trailers. You're waiting for it to be relit. You're waiting for the company to move. You're very rarely shooting. That's why movies take 100 or 200 days to shoot sometimes. So this was five nights, only about four or five hours a night. And we had two cameras shooting you know, almost all the time. So. Uh, we had at least 20 hours of, of footage, but most of it was unusable, you know, because uh -huh. it's, it's crazy tangents. And 
there's so many things that happened that have nothing to do with the movie. This one night, the night that we were supposed to go outside, you know, that we're going to follow them outside in the complete pitch black, just happened to be a night that they were shooting a massive Snickers commercial in our neighborhood. So there's lights everywhere. There's horses. There's horse trailers. There's kids dressed up in, in a Halloween getup. There's hundreds of crew people right outside the door. And so we had to like find these little angles of darkness and somehow make it look like the whole place was completely deserted, even though there's hundreds of people around. Wow. So in typical, for a typical Hollywood film, what's the shooting ratio these days? One to four? I have no Something idea. Like that. Okay. I didn't know <laughs> if, since you've been one obviously... One to 10, one to, yeah, okay. 15. So. A lot, well, I'll a tell lot you the truth footage. now. It's, a lot more footage is shot now because it's all digital. 10 years ago, you're shooting on film, so you're really worried about how much film you're shooting, so you only shoot the, the moments that you need, and you cut, you, 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 know, you have to save film all the time. And you used to only print the, the takes you liked. Now they just, we let the camera roll and roll and roll uh -huh. and roll and roll because it's digital, it's, it's free. And so there's so much more footage now uh, right. when you're making a film. Yeah. So, so obviously with an improvisational film, I mean, most importantly, your actors. So yeah. where, where did you get them from? Uh, did they know... Did they already have, did they know each other? Did, were there pre-existing relationships there? No, or was they, didn't, it... they didn't know each other, uh -huh. they, but they knew me. And so I said, show up at my house. Um, I'm going to introduce you to everybody. You two are married. You guys are a couple. I, we just, Alex and I picked people who seemed like they would be couples. Um, but they were actor friends that I knew I could just sort of say, trust me, uh, just show up and, and we're going to have a good time. But I can't really tell you much more than that. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so, and when you were putting it together, uh, like when I, when I think about this film, it is simultaneously a puzzle film, but also a time travel film, even if it is just a slight, slight weird shift in time. Uh, also, it has a lot to do with Cassavetti's work, with Lars von Trier and Dogma 95, with yeah. British Kitchen Sink, I mean like yeah. sort of documentary filmmaking, like how yeah. conscious of you were were you of these sort of pre-existing genres and bodies of work? Before yeah, well, that was those? the whole intention. That, uh -huh. uh, I, I had been working on these big Hollywood movies like Pirates of the Caribbean and, and others where it's so controlled. And they're great. They're, they're super fun to work on because you have big crews and you can make big visuals. But at the same time, I was a little frustrated with how controlled everything was and how you weren't really allowed to just let people improvise and, and let things happen, let mistakes happen. And I was really craving that chaos of the natural mm -hmm. occurrences that happen when you don't control everything. Because I knew that I had the ability to use that. Like, whatever the, the chaos is, I could use the, the bit that's useful and then go from there. And so I was very deliberate. Yeah, I, I wanted it to sound natural. I wanted it to sound messy. I don't really like the shaky cam aspect of it, but that was just, it had to be because we told the actors, you can go wherever you want. Um, we're not going to block it. We're not going to rehearse it. So that was just a natural effect of that. That's, that's not us faking shaky cam. That's just the way it, it looks because we're letting the yeah. actors do what they actually do. Yeah. I think the sound, we've been talking in class a lot about sound lately and just what a purposeful thing it is. And uh, we watched Blowout recently, yeah. which also, of course, has violence in a bathroom, sort of yeah, getting yeah. back to Psycho. Um, and in this film, so much of the soundscape is the like jumble of voices. Yeah. So like that kind of forces us viewers also to kind of pick, pick paths. Like, who do we follow? Who do we, who do we listen to in this scene where there's so much dialogue topping yeah. each other, which I think is interesting. And then the music is just so subtle. It's only in the silence when it kind of pops through. But it's there most of the time. It's right? weird. There's, there's a lot of music. And a lot of people walk away from the film thinking there's no music. But there's an hour of, of music happening that's really sound design. It's not, it's not a melody, but it's a dense sound design going on underneath. Wow. And so then how much additional sort of sound effects and stuff did you, did you layer in with it? Or a was ton, it? yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the money, this is a very cheap film, but most of the money was spent on sound. Yeah. Huh. 
Because that's the weird thing we found, is that the audience, for some reason, will forgive a bad picture. They'll say, oh, that's just part of the style. But if the sound isn't good, it instantly sounds amateurish. It sounds like a student film. And so we invested in, like, every actor had their own lav. We had two sound people. We re-recorded re tons of Foley, tons of sound effects. It's very layered. It, in fact, if you listen to just the sound, it sounds as good as any professional movie. Yeah. Now, that is interesting, because like the visual shakiness or DIY lends to the authenticity rather than the other way around. Yeah, but if, if you don't have professional sound, the whole thing sounds bad. The whole thing feels bad. Yeah. So, so did you know that this was how it was going to end the whole time, sort of with M's sort of direction, or? Yeah, it's funny. We had one more ending at first, which we decided not to do, which was she was going to end up with a different Kevin and kind of realize that she was with a different Kevin and then kind of just decide to go with it and, and not tell him that. And we changed that. And then a year later, we saw a film called The One I Love, and they did exactly that ending. They did our first ending. Oh, really? wow. Yeah. There were two people from different realities end up together and, and saying, well, that's OK. Yeah. We'll just be together. When I was sort of putting questions together and thinking about it last night and revisiting the film, I sort of started thinking about how all the, all the alternate paths that we see, like that there are more of those lives that exist on a hard drive of 20 hours of footage of, you know, and that that's what the film is about. There's so much weird reflection of. A lot of people have noticed that. Know, and very it's, interesting. It's, uh, a weird irony, but but yeah, you could have edited like infinite amount of movies out of the footage we had. Yeah, right. Uh, so so last year we screened for the cinema series. We screened *L.A. Confidential*, and uh, we had the film's production designer, uh, Oscar award-winning production designer Janine Oppelwall here. And one of the things she brought up was that as a designer, it was her job to build a set that served as a nest for actors. And I was wondering like how you how you created the nest. If you just put them in your house, or how you, yeah, I guess made them at home. There, yeah, the main thing was, so Lorene Scafaria is, played Lee, the, the girl with her gla the glasses. And uh, she's a great filmmaker in her own. She has a film out right now called Hustlers with Jennifer Lopez, uh, which you should go see. But uh, Lorraine, came to my house a little early, and I said, this is your house. This, you live here. You got to understand the kitchen, and you're going to make dinner for eight people. So that's what's going on, is that they really are making dinner for their friends. And, and that becomes the reality of the place. So that created the nest, is that mm. forcing her to make dinner and forcing her to treat it as her house. Wow. So, and then you are, were also responsible for disrupting the nest, right? Turning off the power and banging on the door. That was, you didn't tell anybody, right. any of your cast. That's okay. right. So that's. I did tell everybody, like, you're not going to be humiliated. You're not going to, you know, no one's going to die. But there might be <laughs> some weird things. But like Lorene, again, she, she thought she was in a comedy the whole time. Because I told her, we're going to be improvising. So in her mind, she's like, oh, it's improv. I'm in a comedy. Wow. I think by the third night, it started dawning on her that it was not a comedy. Wow. Uh, when I screened the film for the film and architecture class, we spent so much time talking about the door to nowhere. Yeah. Uh, and so I was wondering, yeah, what like what were the what were the sides or what were the in the descriptions you gave to your actors? Like, how were they to address this bizarre little narrow? Door? Just Beth, the woman that brings oh, really? it up. She was the only one that knew about the door to nowhere. And I can't. I just made that up. That's that's not a real feng shui thing. But I. I told her to use that phrase because I knew there'd be a knock at that door. And it really do, it's, it was in my house, and it was an odd door. There was no reason for it to be there. And we just thought, well, we got to use that somehow. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a film all about passageways and to. And oh, I should say, spaces. then when it was time for Hugh and Amir to leave and, and sort of exit, um, that was a spur of the moment decision. I was like, oh, you guys should leave through the door to nowhere, through the door that's never used. Right. That's so great. Uh, let's see here. Oh, to go back to the score for a second, how improvisational was the score? Or Not at all. Do you know? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we okay. spent months very specifically uh, dealing with that. This amazing composer, uh, Christian Dirud, 
she was using backwards singing, and she had all these different instruments that she would use almost like clay, almost like raw material. She would record them, but then in the computer stretch them and flip them and, and twist them and create this soundscape out of just the raw material of these strange toy instruments and things. And a lot of vocal music is of, of uh, choral music is going on of her layering her own voice over and over. Wow. What other films or work has she done? She's a commercial composer, and I just heard her kind of more avant-garde work, and I thought, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really stunning. But you should listen to the, seriously, just listen to just the score CD, because it's incredible. Okay, cool. And like the bathroom attack, those drums and stuff, it's really interesting. And a lot of people don't even hear it, because the lights are flashing and everything. There's like, there's no music in that scene. Yeah. You go back, like, it's like full on. Wow. So speaking of the flashing, or rather the, the bits we don't see, the darkness. What's, yeah. At what point, right? Because there are these unsettling black spots that come up and break up the film, punctuate it between scenes. At what point did that come into the process? That was early on, because we did a sort of a test of this idea a year earlier. I had most of the same actors just to see if I could do this shooting style that I was thinking of, which is not rehearse it. And, and I just brought them over, so we had a dinner, and I had a camera and someone had a camera, and we tested it. And in that test, because it's not written, and so there's no sort of button for the end of each scene, we just had to cut to blackness. And it had such an unsettling beauty to it that I said, okay, we need to incorporate that into the real film somehow but come up with a rule for it, come up with a, uh, how to tie it into the theme, because there's also the black space that they cross through when they're outside. There's also the blackness of being plunged into darkness when the power goes out. There's also sort of the metaphoric black space between each other and between themselves and, and this distance between our fears and, and our loved ones. And so the black space kind of became the thing that held everything. And the negative space, I'm sure you guys play with negative space all the time, actually becomes more important than the positive space. And so the editor and I would have these long you know, debates about how many frames of black should it be, and, and does that moment qualify as a place to cut to black? Because people are going to think it's a divergent moment, or they're gonna, they're, people are going to put their own meaning into it. And so we need to have our own rule for it so that it's not random so that there really is a structure underneath, even if you don't know what it is. You can feel that at least the filmmakers had a structure to it. Right, and so were there, at one point, were there more of them or less of them? Like, how did you find the balance of? We just had our own rules, which I'm uh, not gonna tell you what they are, uh -huh, but uh -huh. they ha happen in very deliberate places and for very deliberate reasons. And yeah, I'm sure, there, we probably removed two or three because we thought they didn't qualify as, as a a dark space. But, yeah. but again, it, it arose very organically just as because it's not written, you know, when you write a scene in Hollywood, you have a great ending line all the time, like, and I'll see you on Tuesday, you know, cut. And we didn't have those, so we, it, it started as just an organic way of ending a scene. Yeah. yeah. And that blackness then became the whole movie. Yeah. I mean, I think it, yeah, to me, it connects more with like avant garde. Uh, traditions than like typical storytelling. Yeah. So, so with with traditional films, with the fade out, like that's where all of us get to breathe and and relax. But in this film, it's the opposite. It's like, oh shit, what's going to happen? Next? Absolutely. You know? yeah. What is happening in those seconds? What sh what is shifting? Yeah. Well, um, we just we stumbled upon it again organically, and then we said, okay, so let's use that. If that's effective, let's decide how to use that throughout the film. Um. Can you talk a little bit about the color, use of color in the film? Because I've had students asking me, and maybe someone's going to ask you about it, but like the sort of color coding of the film for, for coherence of, of it. Uh, well, you mean... Not, the, just, not just the sticks, but I mean yeah. like the production design, like how the, how the home, you know, how the home is, it, is colored in the sort of spaces in between. I'll be honest, we don't have a lot of leeway with that because we weren't lighting it. You know, we would just ah. had to use what was there, and so we colored it just as warm as glowy as we could. Um, that was very intentional, because you could have kept it sort of white balanced to very neutral, but that didn't feel like 
the glow of, of a homey, cozy place. And that was important because it's supposed to trick you into thinking it's just going to be this talky, you know, white people movie of like talking about relationships, like so many movies are. And we needed that contrast when it was going to get to the darker place. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the home is even at its most terrifying, other than the bathroom, which is kind of white. Stark right? and white. And that was very deliberate, yeah. too, is that we, we did not color that. Yeah. The rest is very homey. Terror, yeah, that, terror is cozy. That was the goal. And it was yeah. also kind of interesting saying, like, how far can we push these cameras? Because when they're in candlelight, they really are in candlelight. And, and the cameras are fighting to even um, detect enough information to make a, a coherent scene out of it. And that would never be done in a, in a real movie. You know, you'd light it to fake candlelight, but you'd actually be lighting it with 100 lights. And we were really you know, um, pushing the limits of what the, the cameras could do, because we just didn't have lights most of the time. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the, the science in the film? I, I know a few, a, few of the, a few scientist friends at UCLA yeah. love this film and think that it illustrates oh. so many. But I know that in other interviews, you've said, hey, this is the Twilight Zone. And yes, Schrodinger's cat is real, but. Yeah. So, like, yeah, how much, of the, how much of the science did you use at least to structure it conceptually? I mean, for sure I went and I educated myself on the concepts, absolutely. Yeah. But I don't pretend that this is actual science fiction in any way. This, this is a Twilight Zone. Um, that's why we use a comet, because a comet is old school and it's like a portent of magical things to come. Um, but yeah, I mean, I read the, all the articles on the multiverse and, and these... Um, theories of, of what happens when the Schrodinger's cat happens. The Schrodinger's cat idea was originally invented to show that that's ridiculous. The, the, the whole point of the brain exercise was to say, obviously, there's not going to be a dead cat and a live cat, so that theory can't be true. And then this whole subsection of scientists said, no, no, no. That is true. That is exactly what's happening. That is alive and dead at the same time. And, and two divergent universes take place. And I loved that. And, and that's actually what gave birth to the title, because I learned about this concept of decoherence, um, which is supposedly what keeps us from interacting with all these other universes. And I thought, oh, well, then the opposite of that would be coherence. But that would create a complete mess if everything was coherent. And I love the irony of that. Like, uh -huh. if we actually lived in coherence, it would be the most incoherent thing possible. Wow. So, so this film came out in 2013. You have been, I mean, you did a ton of, or a lot of festivals at the time, and, yeah. and, and traveling around showing the film. So obviously, you've done a lot of interviews like these. Uh, and I'm wondering, you probably have heard a lot of those same questions over and over again. I don't so, mind. Do you ever change the answer up just to, as an alternate? <laughs> Probably because I forgot though for the last time oh, I answered okay. it. I don't know. Not intentionally. Yeah, not intentionally. Okay. Just was wondering. Uh, how did you get the film out into the world? We like, took it to Fantastic Fest in 2013, oh. and it, uh, you know, we, I had only shown it to some people in my living room before that. Like 10 people had seen the movie. We got into this festival in Austin, Texas, called Fantastic Fest, and it just blew up. It, you know, over three days, it went from we were nobodies, and then at the end, we were like the heroes of the of the festival. And that gave us access to a couple distributors. You know, came out and and uh, said that they would, um, for very little money, <laughs> take over our film. And we said, great, get it to the world. But then how much did you stay involved? Like how much of the, how much of the I guess, screenings were still DIY and still you sort of hustling and getting it out there? Well, at that point, or, once oh. a distributor takes it over, they do all that. And they say, show up at this film festival, show up at this interview, show up at this screening. So I didn't have to hustle that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, which but is great. Cool. But you're still getting contacted, like, by me and oh, yeah, from other, no. other folks? I mean. Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. The whole point was to somehow get it to the world, and it's so amazing to see something that you make in your living room get to these countries. Like, it's big in China for some reason. And I, and I got invited to China last year and got there, and it was just everybody under 25 
knew the movie, and they estimate they estimated that a hundred million people have seen it in China. Wow. Yeah, I don't get a penny from any of that, so <laughs> it's all pirated. In fact, every time we'd have a screening, they'd be like, "We should say we, you know, we we probably owe you a ticket because we've all pirated your your movie." And <laughs> like, no problem. Wow. I mean, to me, that's as a film geek, film historian geek, like that's such a testament to the like how powerful this movie is. Is that it's all its lifespan is just it'll. I think it'll keep going, and building fans and. It's the greatest. It's so. great because again, I've worked on big movies, and you know, people would come up to me on, on after Pirates go, "What was it like working with Johnny Depp or whatever, or Kira Knightley?" And they want to talk about the actors, but on this movie, they want to talk about the ideas. And people have very personal connections sometimes to the ideas inside, and it makes them think about you know, things in their own life and choices they've made and, and questions they have. So yeah. that's really gratifying. Yeah. So before I open it up to a few questions, if you're ready with the mic back there, um, can you tell us a little bit about what's next? I know there's a TV show that's... Percolating? Yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm working with uh, David Goyer, who's a writer, and I guess you guys watched Dark City lately. For the sci-fi class. I don't know if any of you folks Anybody are in here. In yeah, today we watched Dark City. Yeah, we have a TV show trying to get off the ground, and who knows? We'll, we'll see. Uh, by next year, we should know if it's actually real. Cool. Not, a, not coherent. It's a, a different... Uh, it is a time travel story, but uh, one that I did not originate. Huh. And are there other projects, too, that you have sort of out and about with always. management? Always. You, you always yeah. have to have 10 things That's possible, because yeah. nine of them are going to collapse. Yeah. Right. Cool. So let's, let's open it up to a, to a few questions. Absolutely. And, and afterwards, I'll be around if anybody wants to come up after we disperse, too. So do you have the mic? Oh, yeah. OK, good. Uh, I was wondering, because I've seen like, all those super close uh, cameras, are they intentional, or are they just because of the way you took the, the film, so it became a... Did you guys hear that? He's asking about the close-ups, why are there so many close-ups. So you sat in the front row, right? Yeah. So it's very, like... I got this a lot from people who sit in the front row. We, I was at a film festival once, and there was this huge theater, and there's this old man he's sitting in the very front row, and he's like, why is it so big? Why are the faces so big? <laughs> It's like, why did you sit in the front row? Um, but yes, we found out that it, it looked better to go close in the room. If you go wide and you're in the same room the whole time, you are too aware of where you are in the room. It's like an episode of Friends. You know when you watch Friends, the, the TV show, you always know where you are in the room, right? Because it's a wide shot almost the whole time, and even the close-ups are not that close. In a movie like this, that would get very old and, and very tiring. And so the close-ups really helped establish different parts of the room. Um, you would lose yourself in the room. You could have different compositions constantly. The background changes constantly because you have close-ups. So it was just a much more appealing way to watch it. We also knew that mostly people would not be watching it this big. They would be watching it this big on their phones. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It was very intentional. Good question. Um, I was wondering, like, you talked a bit about the, the science aspect of the film and, and based on, like, Schrodinger's cat and stuff like that. Um, I was wondering, um, kind of more in the psychological area of the film, um, I was watching the film and thinking of things like No Exit, like these kind of, like, French um, uh, existentialist things and maybe, yeah. like, a, like, a Freudian, like, doppelganger. I was wondering, like, what type of literary um, inspirations you had on the film or your inspirations on you for the film? Yeah, I mean, No Exit's a great example where hell is other people. This was hell is yourself and, and our own, all of our problems stem from fear of, of the unknown, but it's us projecting the worst parts of ourselves on other people. The only reason we're at war with other people is because we're assuming that other people could do things as bad as we could do them. Um, the reason we're in an arms race with Russia is because we're like, well, we, we could blow up you, so we don't want you to blow up us. And if you're as awful as us, then may, that means you're pretty awful. So this is, a, <laughs> this, this is a story about people who are all 
you know, at various conflicts, various levels of conflict with themselves. One guy actually hates himself. You know, Mike is an alcoholic, and he has this secret he's been keeping from his best friend, and, and he hates himself, and that's why he's so afraid of himself, and he's thinking, I, I need to go over there and kill myself because I know I'm an awful person, and I don't want that awful person to, to attack us. So everybody in the, f in the film has some level of either self-sabotage going on, you know, Emily, the, the lead character, she self-sabotages by not committing to things. When she's presented with an offer to do, have an adventure or whatever, she hesitates and she loses the chance and, and it's really torpedoed her life. So, um, as far as influences, it's really the biggest influence is Twilight Zone in terms of how weird those would get and that kind of existential angst that, that arises of just contemplating reality and, and finding yourself um, in a mundane situation and yet it feels much, much stranger than that. That was the delicious part that, that made us strive for something bigger. Because we, we wanted to feel cinematic, you know, we wanted it to feel like it had big ideas. And if you don't have budget for effects, it's all got to be psychological. Um, when I see one Mike is like killing another Mike, and I saw like, oh, it's pretty identical. Like two characters are pretty identical. I was like, oh, that's like a lot of like uh, computer effect in it. But after I went to like Wikipedia and I found out that there's actually like like twins. They're actually like twins. So yeah. I was like um, wondering if that's like I like you're intentional when you're doing like casting. You're like want to find like twin actor or actress. Yeah, again, when we sat down to figure out what can we make, we said, what do we got? We got a living room. I got some friends who can act. I know one guy who has a twin brother. He's in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was uh, knowing what you've got. You know, if he would have had a, a fake leg, we would have had a scene with a fake leg, you know? Yeah. Any other questions? Don't be shy. No. Um, it's clear that all the alternate realities are like very well thought out and um, purposeful. So like, I was just wondering how you kept track of it when you were creating it, and like, how how you wouldn't make it spiral out into like too many or too little, or like how you just capped it or kept it going, or and then like. How, how you chose at the end which ones to like show? Yeah, it was tricky. At first, we were only going to do two. We were just going to do house versus house across the street. And that would have been interesting, I guess. But the more I looked into it and the more I learned about the multiverse, we kind of felt like, ah, if we're going to be honest with what would really happen, it feels like it would have split a lot more. There'd be a lot more divergent moments. There'd be many, many more realities. And so we said, all right, why don't we just say that they've diverged that night? Because you know, we can't have things that diverged years ago, or you know, we're, we're not going to have the chicken house where everyone's a chicken. We're, it has to be somewhat contained. And so we said, all right, what if the rule is everything started splitting you know, at the beginning of the film? And really, that's what you see in that very first shot of Emily trying to park. And by the way, she's trying to parallel park. She's trying to insert herself into the parallel. Um, but she, uh, when her phone cracks, that's really like the first divergent moment of the night. And so, yeah, it was just, it was just graphing it and, and sort of tracking it myself and saying, all right, well, what would happen if this happened? And what would happen if in this house Mike didn't go off? Or what would happen in this house? And it ended up being very confusing, especially when I realized, oh my god, we see five sets of Hugh and Amir's in this film. Because the first time Hugh and Amir leave to go check out the house, we never see those guys again. The, when they come back the first time, that's, that's a new Hugh and Amir. And then they leave again. And so by the end of the movie, we've seen five sets of Hugh and Amir's. So yeah, it was, it was complicated. Yeah.
Couple more questions. One more question, anybody? Again, you feel free to come up to me after after we disperse. But. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's wrap it then. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much for sitting here. Cheers, man. Yeah.